Hey up everyone. Today's video is a bit of an epic again and even now I feel like some of the bikes I mentioned could well have had a complete video produced around them. You see, not all of the advances in the industry come from the top end of the market. Smaller capacity motorcycles can often be used as a proving ground for new technology and ideas. The 250cc sector was a battleground of the industry for many years. Manufacturers pushed the boundaries to create the best and fastest 250 motorcycles they could. 100 mile an hour was a threshold some thought would never be broken, but it was smashed in the end. Apart from a few exceptions I mentioned, that were small batch handmade bikes not actually included in the main list, these are production bikes, even if some are exceptionally rare. This is a tale of the bikes that led up to and then ran away with the prize for the ultimate Tunnock 250. It's a list that works best done in date order. Then you will see the year on year battles to win the title of fastest 250. Don't forget, there are timestamps to help you find where you left off if you have to watch it in two parts. It just didn't seem right splitting this one up. As usual, there are some curved balls and some more unusual entries as well as the bikes you might well remember riding. So buckle up, this is going to be an exciting journey into the battle for speed and into the minds of the people who built these unbelievable machines. Remember, the Japanese market liked 250cc motorcycles and often kept the best for themselves, so some of these bikes only hit our shores because a few grey imports squeezed their way in. Others arrived here a year or two after their first release in Japan. Some of these fantastic machines were meant for tuning too, but here I'm going to stick to the figures for the standard bikes as much as possible, and I've tried to only use verified speed data. To put things into perspective, first I want to look at today's 250cc motorcycles as a comparison. The Husqvarna Svartpilen and the KTM Duke 250 both produce around 30 horsepower and will reach speeds of around 91 mile an hour or 148 kilometers an hour. Then there's the 2018 Ninja 250R SE, a more highly tuned version of the standard Ninja that will make around 39 horsepower. It weighs in at 163 kilos dry and will reach a top speed of around 105 mile an hour. That is the fastest modern 250cc motorcycle available. As we go through the list, I want you to keep those figures in mind and we'll discuss them more at the end. One last thing to try and put into perspective are some bikes that were made very much earlier than you might think that had performance levels that would still rival the best today. No, they aren't the complete package some of the modern bikes would be, and they were effectively production race bikes, so can't be compared as equals, but they do need to be mentioned. Looking at the cream of the past, we have the 1957 Mondial 250V Albero. It produced 35 horsepower at 10,800 RPM, and had an unbelievable top speed of 135 miles an hour. The bike, which had gear-driven cams, went on to win the 1957 250cc title in the hands of Sale Sandford. Then, there is a motorcycle that became one of the most sought-after designs of its day, eventually leading to Harley Davidson buying the company in 1972. However, it was in 1961 when the Amachi Aladora was released as a production motorcycle. The engine produced a relatively unremarkable 24 horsepower in standard trim, but it weighed just 123 kilos and had a top speed of over 105 miles an hour. In race trim, by 1981, it had reached an incredible level of tuning and was clocked at over 130 miles an hour. So in actual fact, all the bikes that came after were really trying to chase a prize that had already been won. The Aladora would be the fastest production motorcycle for the next 22 years. 
but there are some important motorcycles that tried to take its title away over the intervening years, and they do need to be discussed. I also have to give a special mention here to MZ and Walter Caden. They pioneered the use of rotary induction valves and expansion chamber exhaust design, making two strokes faster and more powerful. Without them, many of the bikes that came later may never have existed. MZ had been developing their two-stroke technology since 1960, and despite the defection of their star rider Ernst Degner with the technology he stole, the design efforts continued. By 1970, the 250cc water-cooled engine was producing over 60 horsepower at around 11,500 rpm. The bike had a maximum speed of over 150 miles an hour. They just didn't have any riders capable of producing consistent results. So, now we'll get to the list proper. And I'm going to begin in 1960. The Honda CB72, or Dream Twin as it became known, was the first Honda and indeed the first Japanese motorcycle to be offered in Europe and in the UK. The overhead camshaft twin cylinder engine with twin carbs produced around 24 horsepower at 9000 rpm and the bike weighed just 153 kilos dry. It had a 99 mile an hour claimed top speed and regularly tested around 96 to 98 mile an hour in various real world conditions. It was built from 1960 to 1962 and would become the benchmark for 250cc performance on a standard road going motorcycle. It didn't have the racing pedigree of the Biabero or the Aladora, but it didn't have their price tags either. It came in at a list price of just £293 in 1962, which actually worked out at around 20 weeks wages for the average UK worker at the time. Next. In 1964, we had the Ducati 250 Mach 1. This motorcycle was produced in very small numbers, with only around 800 ever made. They were only manufactured over a three-year period between 1964 and 1966. The Mach 1 was advertised as the fastest 250 anyone could buy in the 1960s, and although we know already it wasn't, it is still considered today as one of the finest motorcycles ever to come out of the Borgo Panagale factory. The sad news is that with many destroyed on racetracks around the world, an original 250 Mach 1 is now a very rare bike. Next we come to 1967. Kawasaki released the first A1 Samurai. This rotary disc valve vertical twin was the forerunner to the next generation of three-cylinder two-stroke Kawasaki's that followed. It produced 31 horsepower and weighed around 150 kilos dry. This is another motorcycle the factory claimed 100 mile an hour for, and with tuning it would go beyond that. But the best confirmed test I could find gave it a top speed of 93 mile an hour standard, although the conditions weren't great. Suffice to say, that its place on this list was secured because without it we may never have had the later triples. Now I just want to note here that this is the time when one of the incredible bikes to follow in this list was first seen as a prototype. Just remember that and how far ahead of its time it was when I talk about it later. For the next five years despite all efforts and all the research and development no new 250s came to market that challenged the performance of the Kawasaki A1 Samurai or the then aging CB72. So in reality, we had had almost 14 years with no new 250cc motorcycles that were able to break the 100 mile an hour barrier. So, we were due some challenges. In 1972, the Yamaha RD250 was released. Again, Despite manufacturer's claims, the standard motorcycle produced around the same 30 horsepower as the A1 Samurai, 
and weighed an almost identical 152 kilos dry. The power did slowly increase to 32 horsepower by 1979, but speed out of the showroom would again not reach that magical 100 mile an hour figure. It was tested at 149 kilometers an hour or 92.5 miles an hour, but conditions weren't great and another test registered 163 kilometers an hour or 101 mile an hour, but it had a tailwind. An accepted top speed out of the factory seems to be about 95 miles an hour. Now, I know that we all know that many of the various RD250s we knew that did well over that 100 mile an hour mark. But remember, I'm talking about production bikes in stock factory trim, not tuned motorcycles. Part of what made the RD so popular though was the ease with which it could be tuned and ridden. It handled far better than the Samurai or any other bikes that were on offer at the time. Tuning shops turned up everywhere and every 250 production race series for years was dominated by these bikes which were utterly reliable as well as fast. We also got the all new Kawasaki S1250SS in 1972, the Mark 1 version at least. This time Kawasaki unveiled a unique air-cooled inline triple. It produced around 32 horsepower and weighed in at a similar 150 kilos dry to the A1. Kawasaki had been hoping for a significant improvement in power and performance over the Samurai, but initially it was no faster. Later models had the power restricted to just 28 horsepower, so were actually slower than the A1 had been. Nevertheless, the S1 and later KH250 were both great sellers for Kawasaki. Despite their brutal power band, the new learner regulations meant they were one of the best selling bikes in the Kawasaki range. Young riders loved the excitement of the ride and many became lifelong Kawasaki enthusiasts based on that first experience on one of those air-cooled triples. After 1972, we had another six year period where the RD250 had very few challenges despite only managing a meager two horsepower increase in power. Finally, in 1978, the Suzuki X7 arrived. It still only managed the same 30 horsepower as the RD, but it was lighter at 146 kilos dry. Suzuki claimed it as the first production 250cc motorcycle to reach the magic 100 mile an hour mark. And we know from the Ducati Mach 1 and the Monde Albiarbero it wasn't. But did it actually reach that magic figure? Well, in some tests it did, but in others it would barely pass the 93 mile an hour mark. So overall, it managed just about the same performance as the RD250. It was comparable in many ways to the RD, but it didn't really raise the bar. It only managed to pull up alongside the Yamaha in the race for higher speed. It never managed the overtake that Suzuki wanted. Two years later, in 1980, it was Yamaha who again stole the show. The release of the all-new water-cooled Yamaha RD250LC, or RZ250 as it's been called in some markets, finally gave us an engine with more power. The liquid-cooled lump would produce 35 horsepower straight off the showroom floor and weighed a remarkable 139 kilos dry, a full 13 kilos lighter than its predecessor despite the water cooling. Although the factory only claimed a 98 mile an hour top speed, in test after test it reached the 100 mile an hour mark, sometimes in terrible conditions. The accepted figure appears to be around 103 miles an hour. It handled far better than the earlier RDs too, and left all of the competition for dead. It was one of the motorcycles that finally got the industry to realise what an advantage water cooling could be, and the tuners loved them. A race tuned LC250 could achieve very close to the power output of the TZ250 race bikes at the time, and they became so dominant that they were simply given their own race series. Next, 
we have the start of a new generation of giant killers and a very special and very rare bite that some of you may never even have heard of. Honker refused to enter the two-stroke market, concentrating solely on four-strokes for their production bikes. But in the world of racing, two-strokes were king. Success on the racetrack could also mean success in the sales department, so they finally decided to ditch the failed R500 project and build a two-stroke race bike to challenge the Yamahas. The format of the new race bike was an industry first. A V-formation three-cylinder two-stroke design built in both 250 and 500 capacity. Freddie Spencer was the chosen pilot and he went on to win the 500cc title despite a season-long battle with Yamaha and the great Kenny Roberts. The road bike that followed was the 1983 Honda MVX 250F. Even the detuned version for the road bike produced a massive 49 horsepower from the V3 two-stroke, and the whole bike weighed in at just 138 kilos. To make the bike more usable and rider-friendly, it was tuned for mid-range torque and a vibration-free ride. It achieved all of that, but the buyers wanted the outright performance, and the bike didn't actually pass the speed traps at much more than the RD250 LC despite all the extra power. Top speed was stated as 101 miles an hour, and although that was conservative, it rarely tested at much more. 105 miles an hour was the fastest registered speed I could find confirmed. As far as I'm aware, this was Honda's first two-stroke road bike, but I'm sure you will tell me if I have got it wrong. In the same year, Suzuki stole the show with the 1983 Suzuki RG250 Gamma. It produced slightly less power than the Honda at 45 horsepower, but it was built with outright speed in mind. It didn't have the smooth rideability of the Honda, but with a brutal power band and a lower weight of 131 kilos, it just always felt faster. This was confirmed by many speed tests, and the claimed factory figure of 110 mile an hour was actually pretty close to the real world performance of this fantastic motorcycle. Next we come to the story I mentioned earlier that began in 1970. Although not released until 1984, the KR250 had been built as a prototype in 1970. You could say that means when it was released the tech was out of date, but it wasn't. This was an incredible design that had been prototyped and tested in the world of racing and it was unbeatable. The engine was groundbreaking in many ways and the tandem twin cylinder engine was arranged with two single cylinder engines placed one behind the other with the crankshafts connected by large gears. Originally, they used a 180 degree firing order, but this was redesigned so the pistons rose and fell together, which actually decreased the problems of vibration that the earlier engines had suffered from. The exhaust from the front cylinder was rooted centrally under the front of the engine, with the rear exiting under the seat, which allowed a greater lean angle. The engine was fed by two rotary disc valves, which we have MZ to thank for and it also had side-mounted carbs. The engine made the motorcycle really narrow, and it was much smaller and more aerodynamic than most of its competitors. First developed by the great Yvonne Duhamel, it was in the hands of Corky Ballington and Anton Mang that Kawasaki won both the 250 and 350 titles in 1978, 79 and 81, winning a total of eight titles in just five years, with four constructors championships thrown in for good measure. The more I look into this bike, the more I realize I think I'm going to have to do a video just about this motorcycle. Its development and the advances it brought to the world of two-stroke engine technology are fascinating. The KR250 was made as a production bike for just three years from 1984 to 1986 at the end of its illustrious racing career, and it was only made for the Japanese market. 
It produced 45 horsepower and weighed just 133 kilos dry. With a recognized top speed of 112 mile an hour, it became the undisputed champion of the fast 250cc race replica motorcycles. It didn't take long for a new challenger to appear though. Honda had had their thunder stolen by the Suzuki when they released the MBX250, and Kawasaki had set a new benchmark with the KR250, so they were determined to show the world what they could do. 1985 saw the release of the all-new Honda NS250R, a two-stroke 90-degree V-twin engine replica of the world-beating Freddie Spencer race bike. It produced a similar 45 horsepower to its competition, but this time Honda had made every effort to increase overall speed, and the factory claimed a tested maximum of 118 miles an hour. And independent tests, it always achieved over the 112 mile an hour record of the KR250, with a fairly recognized figure of 115 miles an hour being the accepted top speed. It wasn't the lightest motorcycle at 141 kilos dry, but it had superb stable handling for a 250, and it raised the bar again for the industry as a whole. 1986 bought some new challenges, and the big surprise was that both Honda and Yamaha both decided to produce all new four-stroke contenders for the 250cc battleground. Now, I know Suzuki and Kawasaki did too, but it was Yamaha and Honda that shone out for me. You can disagree in the comments and I will respond. The first Honda was the CBR250, which would later become the CBR250R and then the CBR250RR. It continued in production until 1994. The Yamaha was the FZR 250, and as the years passed, that too got extra R's. They had almost identical performance, making around 45 horsepower at around 14,500 RPM. The Yamaha weighed in a few kilos lighter at 141 kilos, with the Honda coming in at 145 kilos, and their top speeds were both around 111 miles an hour. Although not quite the performance of the two strokes, these bikes were seriously capable and sounded fantastic with the incredible red line they both had, as you can hear in the video. Regardless of the four strokes, it was another two stroke that actually stole the show again in 1986. That motorcycle was the Yamaha TZR250. With 50 horsepower as standard and weighing just 128 kilos, it was a physically small bike, but the TZR 250 was fast. The first models had a claimed top speed of 118 miles an hour and had been tested on many occasions at over 115. They were made in several variants over the years right up to 1996. All were restricted for road use at either 45 or 50 horsepower but they were easily tuned for more, and they took over where the RD250LC had left off, with an equal dominance in production class races across the world. Lowering the weight had made a real difference, and so the other manufacturers had little choice but to follow that theme. 1987 saw the introduction of the next Honda two-stroke in the form of the Honda NSR250R, this time, Honda gave up all efforts to make the bike user-friendly and just focused on speed. This was another race replica, but of the 1996 Freddie Spencer bike this time. Over a five-year period, the NSR won the title four times. Now, as you know, manufacturer's specs can be a little misleading, but the NSR produced around 45 horsepower in standard trim and weighed about 125 kilos dry. It had a top speed of around 112 miles an hour, but it was the handling of the bike that made it special. Lighter motorcycles can handle better, but often don't. Honda got the package right, with a beautifully well-balanced chassis and great suspension and brakes. 
the bike made every man, woman or child who ever sat on it feel like a world champion. Every component down to the last nuts and bolts were designed with speed in mind. Next, in 1988, we got not one, but two new contenders to try and take the crown of the fastest two-stroke from the TZR. The Suzuki RGV250 and the Kawasaki KR1. And I will say at this point, it gets harder and harder to quote actual verified speeds. There is so much discrepancy and misinformation. The Suzuki RGV250 produced around 49 horsepower when it was released. And although it got heavier as time passed, it also got more powerful. The first model was just 128 kilos dry. Claimed top speed was what seemed a ridiculous 130 mile an hour. But it was tested at over 120 mile an hour regularly. And the accepted figure now seems to stand at around 125 miles an hour. This was another V-twin and the engine was peaky, which won it many fans. It was hard to ride faster than the TZR but it did improve in time. Later models got beefed up swing arm and better fully adjustable suspension. Although the TZR and NSR were fast, and both tunable for more power, out of the crate, straight off the showroom floor, there had been nothing quite as fast as the RGV250 before. Despite its speed, one thing it was often criticised for was the almost polite standard exhaust note. The factory exhausts were also one of the limiting factors, so many were swapped very quickly. Unfortunately, not so many were actually tuned properly afterwards, and this made the power band even more peaky, and is one of the reasons so few are left in unadulterated original condition now. That, and the fact that so many were crashed by people without the skills to ride them. If it hadn't been for one motorcycle, the RGV250 would probably have wiped the floor for sales in 1988. But there was another motorcycle that stood in the way. Also released in 1988 was the Kawasaki KR1. Kawasaki had moved on to a more standard parallel twin engine from the tandem twin of the KR250. The KR1 engine produced 55 horsepower and the bike weighed in at just 123 kilos dry making it both lighter and more powerful than the Suzuki. Top speed, in line with Suzuki, was also claimed to be 130 mile an hour, but it is the only motorcycle on this list where the claimed top speed was routinely beaten in real-world testing. The bike was tested at 131 mile an hour on numerous occasions, and on some tests it went significantly faster. One test from a relatively reliable magazine showed a staggering 136 mile an hour top speed. This was a raw, visceral motorcycle with no frills, and the rider experience was extreme. Below 40 miles an hour, the power delivery was as uneven as a sawtooth blade, but once the engine was over 7000 RPM, it took off like a scalded cat with fireworks attached to its tail. That didn't stop either. The engine would rev and rev until it passed the maximum power at 10,500 RPM, where the power gently dipped until around 11,000 RPM, rather than falling off a cliff like the RGV did. This made it so much easier to ride fast that it became the bike of choice for production racers in the 250cc class overnight. Steering was razor sharp, and this motorcycle even made the TZR look big in comparison. Something else didn't stop. That was the research and development department at Kawasaki. By 1990, they improved the KR1 even more, and we got the incredible Kawasaki KR1S. Weight was up a fraction at 131 kilos, but power had been increased to 59 horsepower too. The power band was pushed higher, and the KR1S didn't come alive until over 7,500 RPM. Under 3,000 RPM, it was described kindly as useless by one journalist. And I have to acknowledge, this was not a motorcycle for pootling around on. It was a motorcycle built purely for speed, with steering so sharp 
even some professional racers found it hard to handle. This really was as close as you could get to a race bike for the road. Despite Kawasaki still only claiming 130 mile an hour top speed, it was regularly tested at over 135 miles an hour, with one test even reaching 139 miles an hour from a 250. It became the fastest mass-produced 250cc motorcycle for the road, and 35 years after the KR1 was first unveiled, it is still considered one of the purest road-going race bikes ever built. Three years later, in 1993, Suzuki took the RGB 250 platform one stage further. The Suzuki RGB 250 SP was a fire-breathing monster of a two-stroke, producing 61 horsepower at 11,000 revs. It had put on weight and now weighed in at over 145 kilos dry, but it was a much easier motorcycle to ride fast than the previous RGV. The 250 SP could make any half-decent rider look fast, whereas the old RGV and KR1S needed a rider with real skills to get the most out of them. The claimed top speed of 127 miles an hour actually seemed fairly accurate for a change, and its power delivery was much smoother than the Kawasaki, with a stronger mid-range unlike its early incarnations. Despite the extra power, it never dethroned the KR1S as the fastest production 250, but it was a very close fight. That fight was finally won in 1994. A new kid on the block arrived. Aprilia didn't have the historic name of some of the other Italian brands, but they had some fantastic engineers, and they had a trick up their sleeve. That trick was Max Biaggi. They had already begun to climb the ladder of success with Loris Reggiani, but it was the outspoken and extrovert Biaggi who would prove the perfect figurehead for Aprilia's quest to prove themselves on the world stage. The Aprilia RS250 was described at the time as the perfect racing 250cc motorcycle, and it still represents the pinnacle of two-stroke technology, producing an unheard of 72.5 horsepower at the crank, and over 64 horsepower at the rear tyre in standard form, straight off the factory floor. It weighed 141 kilos dry, but had better balance than the TZR, KR1, NSR or the RGB. It won five out of the next six 250 titles, and over the coming years it would amass nine titles and nine constructors' championships, making it possibly the most successful race bike ever made. In road trim, it had a claimed top speed of 130 mile an hour, but this was conservative. Motorcycle News tested it at 138 miles an hour, and I've seen plenty of even faster results, but they have to be seen in context, as some journalists and testers are less than reliable, let us say. Regardless, this was the fastest 250cc prediction motorcycle ever built, and it still holds that title today. Now, as usual, we do have a few honourable mentions. First, I would like to give some credit to both Kajiva and Aprilia. The work they did producing the Aprilia RS125 and the now fabled Kajiva Mito really was groundbreaking. The Mito came slightly earlier, but both of these incredible 125cc machines produced over 33 horsepower and would smash the 100 mile an hour mark. Their rivalry was legendary and would dominate the small capacity racing world for the many years to come. The Kajiva Mito still has one of the most devout followings of any motorcycle ever built and they have come together to make sure that these fantastic bikes are kept going for as long as possible. Although different, both the Kajiva and Aprilia should be recognised as a major step forward in two-stroke performance. Another motorcycle worth a mention is the 1977 Benelli 254 Quattro. This was an amazing across-the-frame four-cylinder four-stroke that had been built to take on the two-strokes. 
It was only two horsepower short of the Suzuki X7, which was released a year later, producing 28 horsepower. It also weighed in at a remarkable 122 kilos dry according to the spec sheets, although this weight was hotly debated. If true, it meant the Across the Frame 4 was lighter than many of its two-stroke competition. Claimed top speed was 97 miles an hour, but it came in somewhere between 93 and 95 mile an hour in most tests, depending where you find the data. Regardless of its top speed, this was a remarkable piece of engineering. It had bags of torque, and when compared to the four-stroke Hondas that had followed the CB72, this bike was lightweight and very nimble, with much better acceleration. As a piece of engineering genius, you have to admire the work that went into making those four 60cc cylinders sing a most wonderful tune, right up to their 10,500 RPM limit. Even if just for that exhaust note, they should be remembered. There are two other bikes I would like to mention too. One of them I'd never heard of until I began this video. The bikes are related, but were aimed at different markets. I'm not sure if they got the market research right here, because I for one would have liked to see the model that we never got. Those two bikes are Suzuki's. In 1990, the Suzuki GSX250F for Cross was released in Japan, and I believe that they made it as far as Australia. To be honest, I'm not sure how many reached anywhere outside of Japan, as it's very difficult to find any confirmed figures, either for numbers manufactured or for numbers sold. A year later, much of the rest of the world got the GSX250S Katana. The Across was a four-stroke, fully feared sports touring commuter bike, producing 45 horsepower at 14,500 RPM and it had a top speed of 110 miles an hour. It just doesn't quite look like it can make its mind up what kind of bike it really is. It does look like a fantastic motorcycle, and if any of you know more about it, then please let me know in the comments. The Katana was a platform that had become a successful seller for Suzuki, and I guess releasing a slightly detuned version of the Across engine in a naked Sportster was maybe a safer bet with the domination of two strokes in the 250cc world championships. The 250 Katana produced 40 horsepower at a slightly lower 13,500 RPM, and despite the lack of a fearing, would reach speeds of around 108 miles an hour. These bikes would have inevitably made more impact if it wasn't for the domination of the two strokes at the time and I wonder how far the design may have been pushed if circumstances on the world stage had been different. Maybe we wouldn't be stuck with the tame, boring 250s we have today. Which brings me to one of my comments earlier. So, now we've been through this list, what do you think about the fact that the 250cc motorcycles of today seem to have none of the flair and sheer excitement that the bikes from our past brought us? Is there any wonder new, younger riders just don't get excited about them? I don't, and I love anything with two wheels. Why is it that the later crop of 250s produce so little power compared to the bikes in this list? And don't just blame emissions. Remember, an efficient engine produces more power and less emissions. Why is it the new bikes are so much heavier too? Even accounting for the addition of catalytic converters and ABS systems, there is no way a motorcycle 60 years old should be lighter than its modern counterparts. Is this the sort of evolution you want? Or is the industry just trying to con you into buying bigger, more expensive motorcycles to keep their profits high even when sales are falling? Why has around 64 years of research and development by people who are supposedly some of the best engineers in the world have actually gotten nowhere when we compare the performance of 250cc motorcycles? If you got this far, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Don't forget to share the video with anyone you think will be interested too if you would.
Subscribing will mean you get to find out first when our regular updates, news and views and other videos go out each week. You can visit the website or the Red Bubble Shop linked in the description for the best biker t-shirts and other merchandise too. There are more exciting motorcycle adventures and other stories from the shed and beyond on the website. So why not grab a cuppa and take a look around? You won't be disappointed. Let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions about videos you'd like me to cover in the future too. Thanks for watching. I hope you get some great riding in. Ride free everyone.